Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, the recording was a challenge, right? So we have started that out. So yeah, this is the first segment we are looking at for uh, this webinar in which we have seen the idea of regular expressions. And now we can be looking at the idea of text speed processing with NLTK. So NLTK is a very powerful package in Python, can be used for majority of text pre-processing techniques. Well, the main techniques that we'll be looking at with the help of NLTK include Uh, we'll be looking at the idea of tokenization. How do we do that? We'll be looking at the idea of morphological analysis. How do we do that? And we'll also be looking at the idea of uh, POS tagging, which is part of speech tagging, right? So these are the techniques we'll be looking at with the help of NLTK. Okay, so this question, uh, so will we be asked about maths behind each model of NLP if you go for job interviews? No, a lot of applications, no. It depends on what kind of job you are applying for. If you're applying for NLP engineer, you won't be asked math, but if you're applying for NLP researcher, if you're going for a, a postgraduate program, or if you're going for a master's thesis, anything like that, you will be asked about mathematics for sure. So a researcher needs to have very good understanding of NLP mathematics, and engineer needs to have idea of how to solve problems with NLP, how to develop solutions, right? So engineer is such a two different prospects and two different types of jobs required slightly different types of knowledge and expertise as well. Okay, so here we go and let's start with that. We'll import the package NLTK for this. NLTK uses uh, many of the pre-trained, you can say models and objects. Whenever you want to use any specific application, you need to download many of them. So here, in our case, for tokenization, we'll need one of the pre-trained model, which is punct. So I'm downloading that here. Similarly, uh, for morphological analysis, we would need WordNet. So WordNet is very popular open source uh, dictionary of text, English dictionary of multiple words and their distance, which NLTK uses for morphological analysis. And uh, tag sets it uses for information about part of speech tagging. And average perceptron tagger it uses for part of speech tagging as well. Right? So these are the four sub modules that I need, we need to download, right? So in case you're using your own local machine, you don't have to do this every time. It's just one time thing. But if you're using Collab, every time you use NLDK, you have to do this. Okay, so if it says true, that means these are downloaded and installed properly, we are good to move forward. Let's see if I have a set of data which could be uh, uh, John Kim. John is coming to meet his brother in Delhi from Noida and John has uh, a car and uh, uh, Mark is enjoying reading novel, right? And uh, Freddie is uh, enjoying playing PUBG game, right? And uh, yeah, something like uh, today, it's uh, good weather. Right. Now, if I have these kind of sentences, I want to, I mean, this is a text data. Let's say we want to convert this text data into uh, chunks of list, sorry, chunks of words or sentences. So that's what we call as tokenization. So main thing first we're going to look at is the idea of what is tokenization, right? So tokenization is a process of converting text into a collection of sentences or words, right? It's a process of converting text data into collection, which could be list or tuple collection of sentences or words, right? So that's what we call is tokenization. So if I have to, let's say, do the tokenization on text, this text data, one of the way to recognize, let's say, if I have to do sentence tokenization, I have to get a list of sentences. So if I ask you a question, how do I do that? You may say that, well, it's pretty simple. Wherever there's a full stop, that's the end of sentence which is logical at least for this 
amount text data wherever there is a full stop it's end of sentence where there is wherever there is a period is the end of sentence so a very simple scenario could be i can do data or split and period it would simply split the data wherever there is a period and give us a list of sentences which is good and you can be happy with that this but this method is very simple but but it may not work all the time in number of scenarios period may not be only used as a punctuation in a number of scenario period may be used as a part of abbreviation it may be used as a part of salutation email ids web urls in number of scenarios instead of period maybe there is something else used to end of sentence uh, to represent the punctuation which could be a question mark which could be exclamation mark in those scenarios this could be a big challenge let me give an example let's say uh, mr mark is enjoying the reading novel and uh, uh, can you drop me email my email id is anshu at anshu dot com thank you please take care if this is the text data now if i use this method it is not going to work well you can see that it is identifying mr as a separate sentence it is identifying anshu at anshu it as a separate sentence it is identifying uh, uh, com as a separate sentence right so that could be a big big challenge to solve this problem what we can do is we can kind of uh, <clears throat> use nltk and that can solve the problem so i can do here nltk dot send tokenize and pass dia here and this going to do the job as you can see that uh, this does the job quite effectively as you can see that it is not recognizing this period as end of sentence whereas it is recognizing this period as end of sentence right it is it is recognizing this question mark as end of sentence which is correct it is not identifying this period as end of sentence whereas it is identifying this period as end of sentence it is identifying this exclamation mark also as end of sentence right so yeah that's the idea so nltk has built in packages available or you can say modules available uh, which can do the job of tokenization quite effectively compared to a programming based method that we try from scratch as you can see that a native method may not be that effective and it may result into a uh, wrong tokenization outcomes compared to when you do it in ltk you get effective outcomes so ltk has such a built in methods available via which you can do the job of tokenization similar to sentence tokenization we can also do word tokenization as well right so it does word tokenization as well so this question how is the nltk able to differentiate that right so nltk is uh, defined with uh, you know it is defined with multiple rules first it does is part of speech identification that means it identifies the part of speech associated with every keyword and then it is also trained with few of the pre trained words for example mr doctor and a lot of such like that and in that if there is a period it is going to consider that as an exception it is also identifies as you know trained with identifying uh, punctuation when the punctuation i mean when the symbols are used as punctuation and uh, when the symbols are not used as punctuation right so all of these uh, scenarios it has pre trained kernels for this right and that does the job so those are a set of rules set of exceptions and uh, some patterns predefined so when you have to do a solo text classification problem you don't have to do this a lot from scratch you get a built in uh, kernel available with nltk which does the job effectively okay so that's one thing everyone you can see that you can also do a uh, word tokenization as well right so that's one idea this was about tokenization next thing that we can talk about is morphological analysis so morphological analysis is quite common word you might hear this as in computer vision case as well but it's different than computer vision here morphological analysis talks about create or converting a word to its root form for example i may have word like cars i want to convert that into car i may have word like uh, boxes or maybe children and i want to convert that to child i may have word like wives i want to convert that to wife 
right? So this is uh, where I can use morphologic analysis for doing this kind of jobs. Now, what are the methods in morphological analysis? To implement this stuff, we have two types of methods available. First is stemming, and second is limitization. Right, so first is stemming, and the second is limitization. Now let's understand what is stemming and limitization. So these are both the methods which are used to convert any word into uh, convert any word into its core format, root form. Stemming generally is faster, but it is less accurate. So if I look back 10 years back, people used to prefer more stemming over limitization because stemming was faster and 10 years back computational cost was a big challenge. You know, if you're having a good amount of computer, having 8 GB RAM was a little uh, unimaginable thing. But nowadays, uh, computational cost is no more a challenge. So people have almost stopped using stemming because it is less accurate, even it is faster. Limitization compared to stemming, it is slightly slower, right? I would say slightly slower, but it is more accurate, right? So because of computational cost, all days the method was stemming, but now the uh, much faster method is limitization. We'll see both of them. No, in Anaconda, you have pre-installed Gayatri. It just, you need to install uh, those, uh, uh, download those uh, sub-modules, right? Which is not even a uh, time-taking task. Okay, so here we go. Let's first talk about the idea of stemming. If I were to do stemming with NLTK, I can do from NLTK dot stem import. There are multiple implementation of stemmers. All of these implementations follow a different set of rules developed by a set of researchers, you know. Uh, so let's say somebody, uh, a specific set of researchers would have worked on Porto stemmer, they, somebody else developed uh, Langston stemmer, somebody else developed any other stemmer implementation. So they are multiple stemmer implementation. They differ in idea, uh, they differ in the methodology which is used for stemming or identifying core words. So let's say you're gonna use Porto stemmer. So I need to just create an object of type Porto stemmer. And I can use this object as ps.stem to stem cars. It's gonna convert this into core format as car. I can use it for something like say boxes and it's gonna convert that to box. It works pretty cool for simple words, but for a bit complex words, it doesn't work cool. You can see that it's gonna give uh, wrong results. For example, if I look at wives, you can see that it gives wrong result. If I look for children, you can see that it gives wrong result as well. So stemmers work cool for, you know, they work very proper for some simple scenarios like plural to singular, only if there is S or ES addition. So they're faster, they work on spelling level and uh, yeah, but not very accurate, I would say. Compared to that, we have limitizers. More powerful, but slightly slower compared to stemmers. Let's see an idea of limitizers. From NLTK dot stem, I can import word net limitizer. I can create an object WD equals to word net limitizer. And we can do WD dot limitize. And we can do, let's say, wives, and it's going to be doing up as wife. Uh, we can also do it for, let's say, maybe children. We want to make sure that you pass only a small case text here. You can do it for, let's say, something like happy, happier. And I just will say it's adjective, so A for adjective. Right? So it's going to convert that to happy. I can also do wd.lemmatize. for let's say went, and I have to say that this is a verb, right? So we here shows it's a verb. By default, it expects a noun, right? So here, uh, A is for adjective, and uh, V is for verb. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, after the session, uh, we will be sharing the Python notebook via email. So yeah, that's gonna be there. 
so yeah this is about the idea of morphological analysis are we good with this i hope we're good this is the idea of morphological analysis converting a word into its root form two methods stemming limitization more powerful or more productive is limitizers right as you don't have computational cost issue you can strongly prefer using limitizers uh, the next part is we're going to be looking at the idea of uh, part of speech tagging which talks about mostly getting the part of speech of every word for example if i have data or i can actually go here and say nltk dot pos tag nltk dot word tokenize donald trump is happy today and uh, he will announce something big okay so let's say we have that and uh, so what it does is it simply identifies the power of speech associated with every particular word so Donald is proper noun Trump is proper noun VBJ is verb in the present tense happy is the uh, adjective today is common noun if you want to see the meaning of all of these abbreviations we can also use NLTK dot help dot append tag sets and I can see the meaning of let's say JJ that means adjective okay so that's the idea about part of speech tagging this question how morphological analysis helps in NLP well that's a good question Sanju so the way it helps in NLP is we're gonna be actually seeing up a real NLP example that's where you're gonna be practically uh, coming across the scenario now let's say that if I'm doing sentiment analysis that means uh, text classification I have 100 reviews of positive class another 100 reviews of negative class in all the positive class people might have used the word happy happier happiness awesome amazing tasty delicious yummy like that now uh, if they have used the word happy happier happiness happily all of these words contribute to the same meaning if I keep these words as it is uh, the overall contribution of these words to be able to identify the sentiment happy would be lay or sentiment positive would be lesser but if I do morphological analysis all of these words will be converted to happy that would increase the strength of word happy in order to be able to recognize the sentiment as positive the model algorithm will pretty well learn that how to recognize positive sentiment how to recognize negative sentiment even if you let's say uh, while training the model you had a huge amount of data and in that huge amount of data uh, the model was using the word you know uh, the word happy was present a lot of times now in a new document if you have word happier the algorithm may not give you know uh, if you do not do morphological analysis your text preprocessor may not give the same a weightage to the word happier as it will give to happy but both should contain same weightage happier and happy are just different ways to represent the same sentiment if you do morphological analysis it will convert happier to happy which would make the algorithm identify that this is a powerful word to be able to recognize positive sentiment I hope that answers your question Sanju there's a question morphological analysis and a morphometric uh, analysis both is same or are there any difference in text classification well morphological analysis more on uh, context to uh, text classification whereas morphometric is a bit of research oriented word but yeah I would say 70 to 80 percent power of same in both the scenarios uh, this question is it possible to identify words of the form very bad yes ram uh, so we identify objectives as well for example uh, you know uh, very happy today so very could be uh, uh, adjective to adjective you can say right so yes uh, you know uh, if we keep these words as a part of our features very or less right or more uh, that helps so that helps to recognize the extent Well, it, uh, you should always do it in text file Siddharth rather than using doc file because doc file are difficult to read in Python or any other language and those are encoded files not a generic files that you can read with any standard tool so text file is more recommended so that was about the idea of power space tagging if you get a symbol along with the word you may want to clean that they just using regular expressions so we've seen already the idea of regular expressions you may want to remove all the symbols using regular expressions if there's any symbols other than the punctuations okay next thing we're talking about very important concept called named entity recognition and I would want to show you this with a package called spacey 
right? So NER is a very powerful tool today and, and one of the very uh, demanding tool in industry, I would say. So how does it work says, um, you ad identify the uh, name of entity associated with a particular word. So for this, I'll be using a package called Spacey, right? And I would say NLP equals to Spacey dot load N underscore core underscore web underscore SM. And uh, let's say we have doc is NLP, maybe, uh, something like uh, John is working for Microsoft uh, in India and America USA region from uh, 20 hyphen 5 hyphen or I would say uh, uh, 10 hyphen 5 hyphen 1998 that's very old 2018 and uh, and has met Kelly a year back okay if this is my document and yeah so let's say I want to uh, sort of uh, entity recognition from this document so I can do from spacey import displacey displacey and displacey dot render doc comma style entities comma jupiter true so this is going to simply recognize the entities associated with this word now it recognizes you see uh, John is a person is working for Microsoft. So Microsoft is an entity which is organization. India is an entity which is geographical political entity, right? USA is an entity which is geographical political entity. Uh, 10 to 5, 2018 is a date. Kelly is a person. A year back is a date as well. So this is what we call named entity recognition. This is a very popular uh, task today. Uh, people who are working into research uh, industry, they use this to uh, tag research papers and identify uh, tokens like researcher name, paper name, or location name of a person. Uh, people working into telecom, retail business, or any other uh, business, like in a lot of businesses, this is widely used to be able to identify sensitive and right information. Uh, even in banking, we use this information, you know, this technique to convert uh, audio calls into text and then remove, identify all such entities and remove them. Uh, from the text data before giving it to the data science team or storing that into data databases. Uh, uh, recently, I have consulted for a project where a telecom company from Southeast Asia has been doing quite similar job in which uh, when they send engineers to telecom towers for uh, doing the assessment, the engineers do the assessment is what is the condition of telecom tower and they write the report in generic format, but they don't, uh, sometimes they forget to put a uh, geographical location. We use an entity recognition to identify the address from the text and look for Google map about the same lat long and put that into a database. A lot of uh, stuff like this are getting uh, automated using NER. So NER is one of the very uh, demanding uh, technique today. So you can develop even custom NER for your use case as well using Spacey as a package. So Encore Web SM is uh, uh, dictionary, I would say, uh, used by Spacey. Standard dictionary is English and Core Web is like internet based dictionary that it uses. Right? It's it's a, not a it's a file name, yes, but you have to download that. And uh, in Collab, it comes pre-downloaded. In your machine, you'll have to download it. Okay. So style int is entity. ENT is sta a function stands for entity. So you want to do entity recognition? That's what you have to say. Int. Okay, so these are some, uh, you know, uh, here it comes up with some pretend model to recognize specific entity. Spacey also allows you to create custom entity recognition kernels as well. All right. So you can now filter this out. Uh, you know, you it gives you option to filter this out. Let's say I want to filter the name of all person. I want to filter the name of all uh, organization. I want to filter the name, value of all dates. That sort of stuff filtering you can do, uh, Fabian, to get the uh, tokens of specific type. Uh, fuzzy logic, 
I'm not sure exactly whether Spacey is using that, but yes, Fuzzy Logic is actually used out uh, for entity recognition to give percentage of belongingness to a specific cluster, right? But it's mostly used on the document level, not on the word level, I would say. So on document level, that means a document consists of multiple sentences or words. On document level, we use Fuzzy Logic, but not on the word levels. I have not come across word levels. Maybe they might be uh, uh, specific scenarios where it might be used on word level. But yes, I have seen a lot of examples of use of Fuzzy Logic on the document level, where multiple words contribute to belongingness into a specific class or category. So Fuzzy Logic helps in calculating the amount of belongingness of a specific document, how much it has belongingness to category A, category B, category C. So one document may talk about multiple context and belongingness shows that which context is most important one and which context may have sub importance or relation to this particular document. So if I have 20 context using fuzzy logic, I can map that context one is being discussed and then it is being rediscussed in context eight and it is being inferred or referred in context seven. For example, if I have a lot of data of research papers using fuzzy logic, I can check that uh, which category of research papers are always referenced in which other category of research papers. Right. So it can give uh, amount of belongingness into multiple groups. Yes, it does the job, uh, you know, but uh, it depends on how, how generic is your dictionary Subramania, right? How generic is your dictionary? So standard names, it does recognize, but a bit, uh, wait, for example, even uh, if I write Barack Obama, I'm not sure is it going to be recognizing that. Right, so this is a very, uh, uh, I would say narrow dictionary. So you see it is not recognizing that I have come across this earlier as well. But if I write my name, uh, Anshu, so I think it's gonna be recognized. Oh, it says GPE, which is wrong actually. I'm not a geographical political entity, right? But if I say something like, let's say a generic standard Indian name, let's say Rajesh, I guess many uh, participants might be having this name. So it is not recognizing that or maybe uh, Rohan, uh, yeah, oh, Rohan is organized organization. So, you know, um, it is trained with a lot of US cor corpus. So uh, maybe it is not gonna be recognizing the Indian names, but yes, it uh, basically gives you option to fine tune it with your dictionary. And you can define your own entity Fabian, yes. Spacey gives you option to uh, develop a custom NER kernel. You can make it recognize custom entities. It's a dictionary, uh, Akanksha, Encore Web SM is a dictionary that uh, Spacey is using to be able to infer to multiple names or name of organizations. Python will you get it uh, as a package for language C, you can download libraries like the US Tagger and every additional package. So you don't have to download that. Python uh, makes it quite easy. You know, you just have to say and you download that, it downloads in backend and you don't have to manually uh, add that to environment and all, a lot of stuff is not needed. Okay. Uh, you need to do uh, first is like you need to actually how do we do feature extraction menu? We're gonna look at in next sec section, which is gonna be text vectorization section, right? So maybe uh, if you continue till the end of this webinar, you will have very clear answer to your question. So this was idea of first section, everyone, where we have checked out the idea of. Uh, text pre-processing. So we have seen the idea of text data. How do you handle that using regular expressions? How do you do text tokenization? How do you do morphological analysis, power speech tagging and named entity recognition? Now it's time to move up to the second section. So now we are starting up with this second section, which is text vectorization. Now you may have a question, what is text vectorization and why do we need that? Let's see that here. So here we're gonna be looking at the idea of what is text vectorization and what do you need that? Okay, so here we go. Uh, so if you have any question, if you want, if it is not related to current context, please keep that at the end. So I'm actually looking at chat box so that I don't meet any, I don't miss any important question. So if you have any question which is not related, if you think, or you may want to keep it for end, please do that. Uh, right, so I'm gonna take one question here. Um, uh, question quality. Uh, check system using NLP. I have used Spacey for uh, matching phrases, but I'm unable to use fuzzy logic and spell mistake. If I have any idea in research paper, please share. Okay, yeah, I can actually give an idea of uh, spelling mistake or spelling correction calculation at the end, Sapan, right? I can give an example on that. 
it's perceptron tagger uh, raja gopal it's perceptron average pre averaged perceptron tagger okay so there is a typo error in that so yeah i'm going to uh, we're going to be sharing the deck uh, video you will get access to video as well you'll get access to uh, the notebooks as well so let's start with the idea of text vectorization here you're going to be looking at the idea of why do i need text vectorization in general but for this you need to have understanding of what is text classification first right so let's go ahead and see the idea of what is text classification in general so text classification is about classifying multiple documents into different buckets uh, for example i can classify articles into technology sports and fashion or technology sports and news or it could be uh, yeah that that could that could be one example or i can classify emails that is coming to my organization into check or it is uh, admin or it is marketing or it is sales or it is hr or classifying a feedback as it is positive feedback or it is negative feedback right so that gives the idea of text classification i mean that's the uh, basic example of text classification right so anything which could be a email classification or uh, you know which could be uh, possibly email classification or which could be possibly uh, document classification article classification tweet classification feedback classification all of this part are are part of text classification in text classification every entity is referred as document for example if you are doing email classification every email is referred as a document if you are doing article classification every article is referred as a document if you are doing tweet classification every tweet is referred as a document right so that's idea uh so this question uh, can we do this tagging for any natural language yes technically it's doable for any language but it's built in available for english for other languages you have to build your own right so that's the uh, difference technically it's doable for any language so yeah uh, we got, we have already discussed our, the idea of what is text classification so it's more about uh, classifying documents into multiple sections so let's see how do we start with text classification right if i have to do text classification how do i go about that okay so let me check if i can give you one a uh, quick example of code file but yeah that looks a little challenging as we have a uh, scarcity of time okay so yeah um, first thing that you need to have is for text classification is you need to have data so you let's say you need to have raw text with labels you need to have text data and you need to have corresponding labels as well right so uh, that's the first requirement that means you need to have text and label for example the example of text and label could be if i'm doing sentiment classification i want to classify a document into let's say uh, two sentiment which could be positive or negative right so uh, i need to have data in this format which could be let's say first document could be uh, i love pizza and this is positive burger is bad this is negative or pizza is tasty and awesome and this is positive so i if i want to build a classifier i need to have text data and that to labeled right so first is you need x so you can think of this uh, text documents as x right so this is your x and this is your y right so you need to have x which is like uh, a set of text documents and the corresponding uh, labels can be thought of as y uh, so yeah that's that's what we need to have raw text with labels the very first thing for any text classification use case is you need to have text and labels right so that means uh, text documents and the corresponding labels yeah you may have neutral class as well but in that in those cases uh, you know the corresponding words will not be used mostly or will not be getting higher weightage okay so that's not a challenge right i mean the neutral class might be uh, labeled as positive or negative in case it is labeled as neutral in that case you may want to generally remove that right you may not want to keep it okay so yeah this is the uh, text data with labels that you need to have as a part of your training data so your training data would always look like this it will have documents one document may be part consisting of one sentence or it may be consisting of more than one sentences as well 
the label could be positive negative it could be two types of label why you may have two categories like positive negative or you may have five categories or you may have 20 categories as well let's say if i'm doing article classification into technology sports and news sorry technology sports and politics and healthcare so i have four classes or four categories in y technology article sports article politics article or healthcare article so that's the first requirement you need to have labeled data which can be used to train the model the second step in the pipeline of text classification is cleaning you need to clean text data right so you need to clean the data and remove unwanted tokens remove uh, you can say illogical tokens right and uh, remove tokens which may not be effective right remove tokens which uh, let's say are occurring very less of the times maybe just used once or twice in a collection of maybe thousand corpus documents a corpus of thousand documents right so this these are multiple stuff that you may want to do remove tokens of specific type remove tokens which have occurrence less than a specific threshold or higher than a specific threshold so that that comes as a part of text cleaning now once you clean the text data you have very clean data which you are ready to you to use it for text classification if you want to build a classifier or you want to do text classification you need to use a machine learning algorithm which could be neural network which could be a summative machine which could be logistic regression which could be uh, even decision tree or it could be random forest as well or neo base right any algorithm so now you want to feed this x and y to a machine learning algorithm to do text classification right but the issue is that all machine learning algorithm you talk about any algorithm whether it is neural network or it is logistic regression or it is neo base right or it is any other algorithm right you talk about svm uh, all of these algorithms svm is generally used for images uh, we very less of the times use it for uh, text as it, it it becomes computationally very slow to handle large number of features in nlp you have very large number of features uh, decision tree also we do not use much but yeah that's a possible technically you can use it yeah we can call a uh, standard neural network an algorithm you know it could be a deep neural network right uh, having multiple hidden layers a standard neural network a deep neural network you know uh, with multiple hidden layers could be called a deep neural network and that's an algorithm right or it could be lstm modification to neural network lstm or rnn or gru or any other a modification to neural network right so now you want to feed data to this to do classification but all of these algorithms what they do is you know all of these algorithms that we are looking at here these algorithms perform mathematics on data they perform maths whereas our data currently is in format of our data currently is in the text format our data is currently format of what we have x and we have y the format of this data is text so we cannot feed the text data directly to these algorithms right as we have to do classification we have to use classification algorithms which could be neural network logic regression new base or svm but all of these algorithms perform mathematics on data they do some computation on data and computation or mathematics cannot be performed on text data right so that's where we cannot feed our data as it is to a machine learning algorithm to do text classification right i hope you all good with the problem here what is the problem the problem is that our data is in text format and all ml algorithms expect data in numbers right and that's where we can't feed our data in the current format to ml algorithms that's where uh, the role of vectorization comes into picture that means we need to use certain method right we need to use certain method where i have stuff like i love pizza and it should get converted to using certain method it should get converted to a vector of 0 0.69 0 0.34 0 0.85 0.11 and 0 0.02 it should get converted to vector like this 
it should get converted to a vector like this, right? Now, that's where you can say uh, we need a method and the method is called as vectorization. So what you need to do is on the text data, you need to perform vectorization. Vectorization is used to convert text into numbers. And once you are able to convert text to numbers, you can feed those numbers to a machine learning algorithm, right? So the whole pipeline of text classification looks like this. You have raw text with labels, which could be X and Y. You clean X and then you vectorize X. Vectorize X means what? You pass text to the vectorization process. You, you pass text to the vectorization process and you get vector as an output of vectorization process. That means to the vectorization process, I'll pass I love Python and it's gonna generate a vector 0 0.35, 0 0.65, 0 0.48, 0 0.99, a vector like that. And once I have all my text document converted to vector, I can directly feed them to a machine learning algorithm, right? That's a very uh, straightforward thing. So we're good with the idea of what is vectorization. So it simply uh, is used to convert text into numbers. Why do we need that? Because if you have to do classification, you need to use ML algorithms. All ML algorithms expect numbers. They can't, cannot use text because they perform mathematics on data and mathematics can only be performed on numbers. So that's the idea here. Now the question could be, how do I do vectorization? Right? What kind of methods can I use? Or uh, you know, how can I go ahead and do vectorization? That's where let's get an answer to that question. So there are two types of methods to do vectorization. You can say frequency based vectorization or uh, you know, you can for simplicity here, you can call it uh, vectorization. Frequency based vectorization or prediction based vectorization. These are two methods for vectorization, frequency based or fre prediction based. Frequency based methods are mostly mathematical methods. which convert text to vectors, whereas prediction-based methods are mostly ML-based, or more precisely, I would say, neural network-based methods to do text vectorization. That means your neural networks are used to convert text to numbers. Generally, prediction-based methods are more powerful and effective compared to frequency-based methods. And, but at the same time, they are computationally expensive. But uh, as now we don't have issue of computational cost, a lot of enterprises are now using, uh, you can say, prediction-based methods. The example of frequency-based method, which is what we're gonna be looking at, could be there are three main frequency-based method out of that third one we don't use. So first is count vectorizer. Second is TF IDF vectorizer. And third is co-occurrence vectorization technique. These three techniques are frequency-based methods or you can say mathematical methods basically. And the job of these three methods is any of three can be used for uh, converting text to numbers, right? So three of them do the same job, but yes, they are differently effective, right? So how, which is better, which is not better, that we'll see in the next slide. But these are the examples of frequency-based methods. In prediction based method, we generally use neural networks to do this job. Uh, long back, if I look back eight years back, it was very expensive method and nobody was trying it out. But then uh, a lot of optimized method has come up where, came up where, where uh, these are even lesser expensive compared to prediction based methods or compared to frequency based method like co-occurrence, only co-occurrence, right? So these are less expensive compared to co-occurrence method, but yeah, uh, now are widely being used. The research in prediction based methods and vectorization techniques exp exponentially uh, grown up or you can say accelerated highly uh, with initiative taken by few taken by few organizations like Google, uh, Facebook and Microsoft and sort of research groups at Stanford and all. So initially uh, Google released the architecture and the methodology and research paper in which they uh, released the idea of how do they do text vectorization and they named the approach called as word to vec. Using neural network, they were converting every word into a vector rather than converting a document into a vector. Right. And then uh, 
a research group at Stanford released a paper in, and they released also a pre-trained neural network called Glue. So Glue was a pre-trained neural network released by this research group at Stanford, which was, uh, which is kind of capable of doing conversion of text to vectors. And then Facebook also released a pre-trained model called Fast Text. These are all open source model now. And then a lot of models like Open NLP, Elmo, uh, BERT, recently the most advanced applic uh, you know, such models released by Google is BERT, which can also be used to do text vectorization. And in fact, it's mostly uh, rather than text vectorization, it actually does this uh, attention-based model of picking specific tokens from a corpus uh, to process it further. Right, so these are a lot of pre-trained app neural network models which can be used for the job of tech vectorization released by these organizations have accelerated the growth of NLP or you can say the, the speed of research in the field of NLP. And uh, today a lot of enterprises, organizations, researchers use these pre trained model and the architecture for developing high performing text classification applications. Right, we'll not be looking at any of these, but yeah, uh, if I show you how powerful they are I can show an example of, let's say, a uh, fast text website, which is a pre-trained model released by Facebook. So if you look at this, if I go download models here, the website is fasttext.cc. You can see that these are four models which are released by Facebook. Uh, first is Wikinews. It is trained on 1 million unique words and total 16 billion tokens. That means 16 billion words it is trained with. And uh, similarly, you can see the last model is trained with 2 million unique words and uh, total number of tokens which are used to train this are 600 billion tokens. So these are this way huge volume of data and uh, the models are trained with this uh, data and pre-trained right models are available for free to use. So this has accelerated the growth of NLP as well uh, quite a lot in recent years. So yeah, that's about uh, frequency-based vectorization and prediction-based vectorization. What we are interested in mainly is frequency-based vectorization. That's what we'll be looking at. Okay, and uh, so there are three methods in frequency-based vectorization, count vectorization, TF-IDF, and co-occurrence. Out of three methods, count vectorization is fastest, whereas co-occurrence is slowest. But out of these three, this is least effective, and this could be most effective, but it is very, very slow. It is even slower than a lot of prediction-based techniques. So a lot of enterprises, rather than preferring to co-occurrence, you get a very good balance of speed and effectiveness, or I would say speed and performance in TF-IDF, right? You get a good balance of speed and uh, effectiveness or speed and performance in TF-IDF. So one of the, uh, you can say a standard approach that industry uses to do text classification is TF-IDF based vectorization technique in frequency-based vectorization or frequency-based vectorization method. But now a number of enterprises have moved up from this to, uh, I would say, prediction-based vectorization approach. Okay, so uh, that's one idea, right? So now we're gonna be looking at the idea of what is count vectorization, what is TF-IDF, and what is co-occurrence vectorization. Once we understand this, we'll go ahead and look at an example of this. So first is count vectorization. As we discussed, in classification, every entity is considered as a document, right? So let's say we have two documents here. The two documents are document D1 is he's a lazy boy and she's also lazy. And document D2 is Neeraj is a lazy person. I hope there's no one Neeraj here. If you are there, uh, please don't mind. It was not intentional, right? So uh, this just eventually came up, right? So we have two documents. He's a lazy boy and she's also lazy. And the other document is Neeraj is a lazy person, right? And we have to do count vectorization on these two documents and convert these two documents into a set of vectors, right? So let's see how do we do that. The very first step that we do is we remove, the very first step is remove stop words. Now the words here, like, is, a, uh, is, also, is, a, uh, these words are considered as stop words. Not only these words, is, am, are, uh, the, 
the and uh, of from the this that those these these words are considered generally in text classification case as stop words because these words do not contribute anyways to the let's say if i'm doing sentiment analysis they don't contribute of these words will be similar in positive sentiment document and also in negative sentiment documents as well okay let me repeat again let me repeat again okay i hope i'm audible now am i audible now Okay, so the idea is that uh, there is that we were discussing about uh, stop words. So the very first step that we do in the process of count vectorization is to remove the stop words. The words like uh, is, am, are, of, the, this, that, these words are considered generally as stop words. Why do we consider them as stop words? Because the composition of these words, the composition of these words remain same in every class that you're doing. Uh, classification for example if I'm doing sentiment analysis and I want to classify uh, the feedback as positive negative right so if I have 100 documents of positive sentiment 100 documents of negative sentiment the composition of these words like is am are of the this that will remain same in both types of documents or if I'm doing article classification as politics technology or sports articles the composition of these words is am are of the this that will remain same in all the three categories and these words anyhow do not uh, contribute to identify the type of class for example they don't contribute to identify whether it is politics article or sports article or uh, healthcare article generally we have a standard dictionary of such stop words in english and in python as well we use the standard dictionary and work with that so first step that you do is you remove the stop words yeah, not is by default a stop word, but in a number of cases, you may not want to consider that as a stop word. So technically, yes, if you look at a default dictionary, it would be part of stop word, but uh, you may want to remove the not word from the stop word dictionary, at least for sentiment analysis, I would say. For sentiment analysis, you may want to remove it. For let's say article classification, you may not want to remove it. You, there's, no, there's no meaning of not in article classification, but there's a meaning of a, a not in sentiment analysis. Akanksha. So it depends on use case. Uh, in sentiment analysis use case, not is not a stop word. It's an important word. But in article classification, it is a stop word. Uh, repeated words will not be count counted as stop words. Right? For example, lazy is a repeated word, but we want counted stop words. Let's see how do we do that. So first we remove stop words and then we create a dictionary of unique words. Right? That means you have almost removed the repeated words, Shweta, you can say here, right? So he, she, and uh, lazy boy, Nidajan person. These are six unique words. So we have total six features. So these unique words are actually a set of features, you can say. These unique words are set of features. Right? Uh, no, Rajagopal, unique words are not considered as stop words. Technically, we just, uh, you know, I mean, repeated words are not considered as stop words, right? So we don't remove them. It just, we take one occurrence of it, right? So technically you're removing them, but they would be one.
Okay, I hope I'm audible. So I think there has been some audio issues. Uh, I mean, sorry, so there has been some network issues. I hope I'm audible to all. Thank you for the uh, confirmation. Okay. So yeah, uh, let's go further. Right, so we were discussing about uh, the feature extraction here, that's count vectorization, how does that works, right? So uh, uh, we, I'll repeat again, we remove the stop words, right? We remove all the stop words, like is uh, also am, are, the, of. We get a dictionary of unique words, which are considered as our features. So we have six features and we have two uh, documents. Now what we do is, we do the count of every feature, right? So what we do is we make use of count here. Right? Count is very important word here. So we look at count of how many times he is occurred in D1. So how many times he is occurring in D1? So you can say he is occurring one time in D1, right? So he is occurring one time in D1. How many times she occurs in D1? So word she occurs one time in D1. You can see he is occurring one time in the whole D1. She is occurring one time in the whole D1. We look at count of it. Lazy, how many times lazy occurs in D1? So you can say lazy is occurring two times. One time, two time. So the count of lazy in D1 is two times. Boy, one time, so we'll say one. The count of Neeraj in D1 is zero times, so we'll say zero. The count of person in D1 is zero times, so we'll say zero. The count of, uh, then we'll go for D2. So D2, the count of he for D2 is zero times, so we'll say zero, right? So there's no he in D2, right? There's no she in D2, so we'll say zero times. There's a word lazy here, right? So we'll say lazy is one time. Boy, there's no word boy in D2, so we'll say zero time. Uh, Neeraj is present one time, so we look at count of it, and person is present one time. So these, whatever values you get from count, we call it as count vector. That means the vector conversion of D1 would be one, one, two, one, it's one, one, two, one, zero, and zero. Whereas the vector conversion of D2 would be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. This is a simple idea of count vectorization, right? So it's very simple uh, language. You can say it's more about uh, converting a text data into a set of numbers, which we call as vector, right? So converting text data into vector. If we go to the idea of count vectorization, right? the way it works. So uh, this is how you get vector corresponding to that. The benefit of this is, let's say if I'm doing sentiment analysis, I have 100 documents which belong to positive class and the other 100 documents belong to negative class. If I do the count vectorization, I would be having words like happy, delicious, awesome, amazing, tasty as my features. I'd also be having words like bad, stale, worst, it as my features. Now the counting or the value of these words like happy, delicious, amazing, awesome, the value of these words or these features will be high for positive documents and the value of these features will be low for negative documents. Whereas the value of uh, the features like lazy, stale, hate, bad, worst, worst will be high for negative documents and will be low for positive documents. So count vectorization is gonna highlight those words which are specific to positive documents and specific to negative documents, which will help the further machine learning algorithm to be able to learn that these words are important to recognize positive document and these words are important to recognize. The other words like bad, hate, worst, stale are important to recognize in the key documents, right? So that's the idea of count vectorization. Okay. Now, this is a very simplistic method. No mathematical computation is happening here. Just counting is happening. But this method has a lot of drawbacks. Drawbacks could be, let's say, you know, uh, there might be a lot of common words which might be occurring a lot uh, in both type of documents. For example, if I have restro feedback, right? I have 100 documents of restro feedback, which are positive. Another 100 documents of restro feedback, which are negative. Right? All the feedback, positive, negative. The other words like pizza, burger, table, chair might be also used out. So along with the words happy, delicious, tasty, yummy, amazing, awesome, bad, worst, uh, stale, hate, along with these words, which are important words. The other non-important words like pizza, burger, or uh, table, chair, AC, waiter, these words will also get higher weightage, which would remove or which would decrease, I would say, which would decrease the effectiveness of the uh, features being extracted. 
right? And which would also uh, decrease the performance of the ML algorithm as well, right? So that's one of the drawback of configurization. And there are many such drawbacks actually, but this is the main drawback which you can resolve in next uh, method, which is TFIDF. So let me know if you're good with this part so far, everyone. Any question that you have about uh, contractorization, are we all good with this, right? Uh, the understanding of contractorization, because this is what we're gonna be using up and mainly actually we'll be using our TF idea for email classification scenario, right? So I hope we have a free understanding of this by now. Okay, now we'll be moving further to look at uh, the idea of uh, We'll be moving further to look at the idea of uh, next method that is the idea of method, right? So which is what we call as term frequency and inverse document frequency. So the next method is termed as TF IDF. So TF IDF stands for term frequency and inverse document frequency. It just stands for term frequency and inverse document frequency. Now TF IDF is a method which is uh, you know, very popular. Yeah, we're gonna be actually looking at all of these methods practically as well, you know, all of these implementation practically now because, but before that we need to have fair understanding of how do we implement this as well. Okay, so you can say TFID if is a method which is gonna be, uh, you know, uh, better than, which is better than the uh, earlier method which is contractorization in a way. Here term frequency actually represents exactly same as count vectorization Whereas inverse document frequency is something which improves the count vectorization output and it decreases the weightage of the very popular words like uh, pizza, burger, and table, and chair and improves up the weightage of other less popular words like uh, happy, sad, or uh, delicious, bad, or tasty, or amazing, like this, right? So first let's understand what is TF and what is DF, right? So you need to understand the idea of what is TF and what is DF, what is term frequency, and what is document frequency. Let's see if I have three documents. One is pizza is amazing, and I love pizza. The next document is burger and pizza are friends. The third document is Pizza is good to have always. And the fourth is Burger is my favorite and I love Burger. Now, if I have to look at term frequency and document frequency, so document, term frequency is what? How many times a word occurs in a particular document is the term frequency of that word for that specific document. For example, uh, what is the TF if I look at TF of PISA? So TF of PISA for document D1 would be how many times it occurs in document D1. So you can see in document D1, it occurs two times. So TF of PISA for document D1 would be two. TF of PISA for document G2 would be one. TF of PISA for document D3 would be one. And TF of PISA for document D4 would be zero. That's called term frequency, which is same as count vectorization. You just count how many times a word occurs in the document. What is document frequency or DF? DF is not counted document wise. DF is in how many documents this word has occurred. So for example, if I have to look at DF of word pizza, DF of word pizza for all the documents. So in document D1 it's present, in D2 it's present, D3 it's present, D4 it is not. So DF of pizza is three. That means it is present in three documents. DF of burger is not in D1, yes in D2, and uh, no in D3 and yes in D4. So DF of burger is two. DF of, let's say amazing, it is only present in D1, so it is one. And a DF of love is two, right? So that's called document frequency. It's present in D1 and D4. 
So that's called document frequency. Using term frequency and document frequency, we calculate T of IDF using the formula. This one, weight equals T of multiplied by log of capital N by DF, right? So log of capital N by DF, right? So this is a formula we use. And this formula calculates T of IDF for every word of every document, right? So the benefit is as DF is in denominator, right? DF is in denominator, you see capital N by DF where capital N is the total number of documents. So the words which are very frequently used like PISA, you see PISA is very frequently used. It will have higher DF. That means one by DF for PISA will be very low, but for amazing, it will be very high, right? One by DF of PISA will be very low. One by DF of amazing will be higher. So you can say inverse document frequency is surpassing most commonly used word like pizza table chair burger it's surpassing them and and decreasing their weightage down whereas it is keeping the weightage of slightly less commonly used words like amazing and love and mostly amazing and it could be uh, let's say uh, other words like uh, maybe uh, good so the df of good is also one the df of uh, maybe you can say uh, favorite is also one Right. So you can say one by DF of pizza burger will be low, but one by DF of amazing and good and favorite will be high. Low will be also eventually low. Right. So uh, taking inverse document frequency improves the overall vectorization outcome by surpassing the weightage of very commonly used words like uh, pizza and burger and table and chair, as I said. Right. That's where inverse document frequency helps and TF idea becomes a better vectorization method compared to count vectorization. Okay. So that's the idea of TF idea vectorization. How does that works out? The next method is last method of frequency based vectorization is co occurrence vectorization. Co occurrence vectorization is a method in which we use all the words without removing stop words and map that with all the words. The difference of this method compared to previous two methods is in previous two methods, we were converting a document into a vector, but in this method, we convert a word into a vector, right? So let's say we have four documents. D1 is he is not lazy. D2 is he is intelligent. D3 is he is smart and D4 is he is not intelligent, right? These are the four methods that we have, okay? And uh, which is D1, D2, D3, D4. What we do is we arrange all the words. He, she is not lazy, intelligent, smart. We arrange all the words in row wise and in column wise. Then we look at how many times he and he are co-occurring together in the same document, right? So he and he are coming all together. He and is are occurring all together, which is four times. Uh, he and not are occurring all together. He and one are occurring all together, right? So he and lazy are occurring all together one time. He and intelligent are occurring all together, which is two time, right? So we look at how many times the word are co-occurring with each other in every document. This creates the vector for every word. Now, once we get this matrix, now you can get vector for every word. For example, the vector for he could be uh, zero, four, two, one, two, and uh, one. That's a vector for he. Similarly, I can get vector for is, it could be four, zero, one, two, two, one, right? That could be a vector for uh, you can say he and a vector for is similarly. I can get a vector for smart Which could be uh, one one zero zero and uh, uh, Zero so like this I can get vector for every word and that's how we can get a matrix for every document Right, so co-occurrence is going to create a matrix for every document which is different compared to previous two method in previous two method it were converting uh, you know the previous two method it was it was converting simply yeah there's a zero here as well right in previous two method it was converting mostly a document into a vector but in this method a document will get converted to matrix if there are a lot of documents there will be a lot of matrix this makes all this improves increases the computational cost associated with vectorization right and also with machine learning algorithm as well i mean if i train the model so that makes co occurrence vectorization method as a very expensive method and this is just four documents. Imagine if I have 10,000 documents and length of every document is 100 or 200 like that. The number of unique, the number of all the words would be quite heavy and I, have, I will have very bulky matrix to process. So this process makes a co-occurrence vectorization as a very expensive process, right? 
and um, that's where uh, it becomes uh, difficult uh, to use this method and uh, a lot of people rather than preferring this method uh, go ahead with prediction based embeddings right prediction based vectorization techniques okay so yeah that's more of idea okay Yeah, so it's like he and he, in how many documents he and he are occurring together, Ankita. So you see in no document, he is occurring with he. So he and he are co-occurring with each other zero times. He and is are co-occurring with each other four times, right? So in four documents, one document, he is, he is, he is, he is. So four times he and is are occurring together. He and not. In this way, he and not is there. He and not are occurring together. So he and not is two times like that. So it's a co-occurrence value. So this idea of co-occurrence vectorization, right? So this was the section two, everyone, and which where we talked about the idea of vectorization techniques. So whenever I, ha I have to do text classification, I have to use text vectorization method. So we'll now be using this pipeline here. We'll now be using this pipeline here and moving up to the third segment, which is gonna be uh, programming part and which is where we're gonna be looking at the idea of text classification, right? So now we are going to be looking at a practical example of text classification on email classification data set. So now we're going to be starting up with section three. In section three, we can talk about text classification, right? In the previous section, we talked about the idea of vectorization and how do we do that? Now we'll move to classification where we will see an example of 20 news group data set and uh, that's a data set of around 11,000 emails and uh, all the emails are labeled. So we have to use that labeled data and develop a classifier which can learn from the labeled data. And for any new document or if in any new email, it should be able to classify uh, the category associated with that email. So here we go and let's get started. So here we go. So I'm going to take a new program here. And we're going to say this is as uh, I would say email classification on news group data set okay so we're gonna be using a few packages here i'm gonna be importing them up so import re uh, we're gonna be also using uh, from sklearn import data sets from sklearn dot feature extraction dot text we're going to be importing tf idf vectorizer right so that's a vectorizer we're going to be importing here and uh, right so after that uh, i think yeah these are the main packages that we need we'll be using an algorithm let's say call as uh, new base because uh, this data is we're going to be dealing up is going to be a very heavy data we can't afford neural network here so we'll say from sklearn dot uh, new base we're going to import multinomial new base right uh, these are the packages that we are going to use here And uh, yeah, so these are the packages that we need uh, so far here. So first let's load the data. So we'll say train data is data sets dot fetch. So you don't need to have this data set. It's already available with scikit-learn. And I can just uh, make, mention here subset as train. So I can get this train data by default. We also have test data also available here as well, which we can as well use. But at this point we'll by default load only the train data and uh, yeah 
uh, from the string data will extract the features that means the text documents and the label as well so i would say x as train data dot data and y as train data dot target and names i would say is or i should say class names as train data dot target underscore names so let's print out the length of x and let's print out the length of y so we are extracting data here we'll understand and discuss about data what data we have here actually so here we have data of around 11,314 emails right so it's data of around 11,314 emails so X is a collection of 11,000 emails and Y its corresponding label. All of these emails are labeled as which category they belong to. So let's say some emails are part of uh, Microsoft PC complaint. Some emails are part of category Windows PC complaint. Some emails are part of uh, baseball. Some emails are part of sales. Some emails are part of automobile like that. We have total 20 categories, right? So here we have data or you can say email belonging to 20 categories, right? So I could print them out. So you can say print class, I can simply say class. So all our email belongs to these 20 categories. Let's see one of the email. So if I print X of zero, so you see the length of X is what? 11,314. If you print X of zero, so X of zero is an email. You can see that this is an email. The email is that from lerxt at vam.umd.edu, where is my thing? What car is this? University of Maryland, College Park. I was wondering if anyone could enlighten me on this car I saw the other day. It was a two day sports car, looked away from late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was a brick clean. It was called a brick clean, and two days were really small in addition. All the front row bumper was very separate from the rest of the body, like that. So this is an email, right? Like that. X has X is actually a collection of emails, eleven thousand emails. This is tenth email. I have a line on Ducati 900 GTS 978 model with 17k on the clock. This is tenth email. If I look at hundredth email, this is hundredth email. Subject uh, software for sale. Software publishing Superbase Windows 4 version 1.3 is $80. OCR system read write uh, $65. OCR system read write version 2.0 for DOS is $65. This is 100th email. If I look at 500th email, this is 500th email, which is very short. As you can see, uh, does anybody has document of .rtf file or where, where I can get it? Thanks in advance. I got one from Microsoft Tech Support. Right. So we have data of multiple. Uh, emails, right? So I hope you're good with this, right? So we loaded data from train data, X and Y. X is collection of 11,314 emails. Y is collection of 11,314 targets or labels. Y is not email, it's the corresponding label. We'll see that also. So all of the email belong to these 20 classes. There are such 20 classes. All of these are 20 classes, right? So every email belong to any of these 20 category. Yeah, this data is available online. Uh, you can directly load it from scikit-learn as well. So I can simply print here, let's say, class name. If I simply print here, y of 500. So y of 500 belong, uh, has data of to which category that this email belongs to. So this email belongs to second category. What is second category? Zeroth category is Ethism. First is gra Graphics. Second is OS, MS, Windows, Miscellaneous. So this email belongs to Microsoft OS Windows miscellaneous. We can also print that also print class name of Y of 500. So this belongs to second category, which is computer OS MS Windows miscellaneous. If I look at 800th email, this is 800th email, which is very small. As you can see, it's nothing almost. It's from University of Chicago, astronomy and physics. And this email belongs to automobile and has nothing in it. So this is, you can see a junk email, you can think of it. If you look at 1600th email, 
this is a little lengthy email, 1600th email, right? And uh, you can see that uh, here we have data of, looks like uh, Kamit Chameser got it from a few sources, they wrote something, I will attempt something like that. And um, if you look at 1600 email, which category it belongs to, so 1600, this belongs to 19th category, which is a religion talks. So this is more of a religion based email, right? So like that we have around, uh, I would say, I can also look at uh, 10,000th email, right? So 10,000th email, right? We have why anyone would order an SHO with automatic transmission is beyond me, right? So this is 10,000 email. I have to disagree with this. I have a 90, to Z28 with a 350 on four speed auto. So we're looking at 10,000 email. We can also look at 10,000 category, right? What is the 10,000th category? And what is 10,000th category? Okay, so it's autos. That means it's part of automobile email. So we have total size as we have seen 11,314, right? So the total we have, uh, if I have to print that, you can say print length of X and print length of Y. So X is our features and Y co contains the digit which represents the category number to which it belongs to. So 11,314 is the, uh, uh, the size of data that we have. So that's what we have as a part of X and Y. So X is corresponding corpus, you know, which is text and Y is corresponding uh, label or target name, the category name to which it belongs to. Our job is to use this data and train a machine learning algorithm, which can learn from this data. It can learn that how emails of different categories, for example, how to recognize emails of computer graphics, how to recognize emails of Microsoft Windows miscellaneous, how to recognize emails of category IBM PC hardware, Mac hardware, Windows X, for sale, automobile, aut motorcycle, sports, baseball, sports, hockey, crypto cryptography, electronics, medical space, religion, Christian, politics, guns, politics, Middle East, politics, miscellaneous and religion miscellaneous. So, uh, these are multiple categories that belongs, right? That are here. We have such 20 categories here. So we have 11,000 emails. Every email is having certain corpus or text available and it is labeled as that it belongs to a specific category, right? Which is any of these 20 category. Right? Our job is to use this data and train a machine learning algorithm which can learn from this data and for any new email, it should be able to categorize that this email is part of a category or motorcycle or auto or for sale or Mac hardware or IBM hardware or Windows PC hardware or graphics. It should be able to predict the category associated with that particular email. Okay, so that's our target. I hope we all are good with the understanding of objective, right? What is the business objective here? What is that we have to achieve, right? So what is that we have to achieve is that we have to build a classifier which can learn from this data and for any new email, it should be able to predict to which category it belongs to. Now, uh, issue is that our data is not super simple or easy. You can see that our data has email IDs. Maybe these email IDs do not help in recognizing what is the type of email. It has a lot of email ID mentioned. It has a lot of CC email IDs, symbols like this, which are useless, all right? It may have some email IDs. It may have some other symbols, which are again useless. So there's a lot of unwanted token. Every email has a very complex text, you can say, and a uh, variety of emails is a very challenging data, right? If you look at category of email, if I look at uh, maybe uh, 1000th email, uh, you can see like this, you know, uh, we have uh, email IDs, we have subject, which is like mouse cursor. Maybe this 3.1 doesn't make a lot of sense, but SS24X doesn't make a lot of sense. You can say, right, lines, the words like from subject organization and lines do not make any sense. The email ID as well do not make any sense and we may not want to keep that, right? So there are a lot of tokens which are unwanted and you may want to clean that text data. For that reason, you may want to use uh, regular expressions to do this job. And using regular expressions, you can clean this. You can remove email IDs, you can remove URLs, you can remove uh, any specific token which belongs to a specific category. Okay, so that's the idea here. 
right so let's go about this right so technically what sh process should we follow up is we should go ahead and clean this text data we should do the pre-processing and then we should uh, sort of go ahead and do the vectorization using count vectorization or tfid of vectorization and after that we can actually apply a machine learning algorithm right so we'll do that as well but before cleaning we'll actually go ahead directly with text vectorization and there we'll be able to realize that why do we need to do cleaning right so there while doing text vectorization we'll be able to realize uh, why do we need to do text cleaning right so let's go ahead and do that here so we're gonna be looking at the idea of text vectorization okay now for this we're gonna be using a method called tfidf as we already imported the object of tfidf so we can be doing that so we can create an object here let's say tfidf equals tfidf vectorizer uh, we need to pass certain attributes which could be let's say lowercase is true we want to convert every token into lowercase so that uh, happy with capital h and happy with small h should not be considered as a separate token right we want to put here uh, stop words as english so it will use a built-in standard sklearn dictionary to uh, remove the stop words uh, we'll not here use any other uh, right we can also put here analyzer as word that means it will not do symbol analysis and all right so it would uh, make it more effective so now here we can go ahead and uh, first remove all the stop words and get the unique set of features for that we just need to say tfidf dot fit now this is very huge volume of data right 11,000 emails think about it it's very huge volume of data right so let's check it out here you're gonna be able to see that here right so if I do tfidf dot fit it's gonna be training that out and we're gonna be getting a tfidf trained object we are only talking about vectorization we have not yet started ml so far now if I look at all the unique feature words right so after removing stop words what are the unique words first if I look at length of the unique words len of tfidf dot get feature names so if you look at length of unique words we have total 129,796 unique words after removing stop words from this 11,000 uh, 11,000 emails we have total 129,000 796 unique words right which is uh, you can say which is a very high number of features which is very huge number of features if you look at those features those unique words as well tf idf dot get feature names these are those unique words and you can see that these unique words do not make any sense about uh, you know uh, which category they you know what uh, they don't make any sense about what do they represent or if I simply say TFID of I'm actually see it uh, in multiple oh, it shows like this which is let me print it right so these are unique features that we have you can see these are unique features that we have And these features initially you can see that there are a lot of numbers here right and uh, these are a lot of numbers here right so and then we have a lot of tokens let's say now if you look at this correspondent correspondence corresponding correspondingly corresponds now if you uh, if you would these all are considered as separate features right correspondent correspondence corresponding and correspondingly and corresponds these all are being considered right now as separate features you can say that corridor and corridors are being considered as separate features now uh, these features you can say that here multiple features are representing the same meaning right so we don't want to uh, kind of uh, we may not want to have these words cross you know containing the uh, uh, same set of uh, containing the same set of uh, meaning right so here we should have done limitization and stemming or stemming any of these method you know and that would have cleaned this data and that would have given us uh, a good data set as an outcome okay there's a question from where uh, 
yeah all you see the 11314 emails are data set and we have done, taken that data from scikit-learn so scikit-learn has a reference to the data set whenever you run the code it's going to be downloading this data set from a uh, repository which is on scikit-learn repository and uh, from sklearn you can get that out right so you can see that it's a data set of 11000 emails you can get that from sklearn you can also load a similar data from text file as well it could be a csv file or it could be a sql database table also right technically you may want to load it from there but this data set that we were using currently it's a built in data set available and the reference to that is available with scikit learn yeah you can also get a lot of similar data sets from kaggle as well it's a very good source of data sets okay so coming down here you can see that we have 129000 features now these volume of features are very high so one of the thing is that we have a lot of features which are not useful which are not logical at all right that's one challenge right all of these numbers do not any ways contribute to identify the specific type of document or specific type of email other than that the other big challenge is we have 129000 features right we have 129000 features and 11000 documents let's take a round figure here and do a general calculation if i have 10000 documents right so i have 10000 documents so we have 10000 documents let's say so can i say that in 10000 documents you can easily expect 100000 unique words those could be considered as features for example here in 11000 documents you have 129000 uh features or unique words now if you keep this much of features what what is a big challenge here in uh, if i have 10000 documents and with that if i have 100000 unique features let's say the value of every df idf is represented by a float 30 to generally it would be represented by float 64 but for simplicity let's say float 32 value now float 32 means 32 bit size is the size of every df idf output now 32 bit size means it's 4 bytes that means every value of tf idf is capturing 4 bytes of memory in your ram and if you have that for 10000 documents and 100000 features so 4 into 10000 uh, into 100000 it's going to make it a 4 gb of data that means your whole vector after vectorization process the feature vector is going to be of size 4 gb that's going to be very huge data and imagine if you process that with a neural network with a lot of hidden layers and hidden neural neurons it's going to be computationally very expensive it's going to be taking a lot of time to process that and train the model right so if you keep the number of features as as high as let's say 129000 words it's going to be very expensive for you to train that model at the end of the day even if you train the model as the number of features are very high you're going to have easily an overfitting model right so these are challenges right the challenges are that when you have high number of if you don't do text cleaning or if you don't do text pre processing you will end up having large volume of features which would make your training unnecessarily expensive at the same time it will result into an overfitting model secondly you will have a lot of unwanted features like this which are not at all useful features you may want to remove them right so for this reason you need to actually do text pre processing and that helps out a lot in improving the uh, number of features all right so let's now go back and do text cleaning here so we'll go back and do text cleaning here right i hope we have understanding of why do we need to do text pre processing and cleaning right Uh, we can do a lot of stuff with this data set is is a very opportunity to see data set i would say and there is a lot of opportunity about doing text cleaning and pre processing i would say a very simple example of uh, i will i'll show a very simple example of using uh, regular expressions so let's say if i have x what i can do is i can say for uh, doc in x or i would say for i in range of length of x it's a doc equals to x of i doc equals to re dot sub we can first try to remove all the email ids for that we can say anything between an email id may contain anything between a to z capital a to capital z 0 to 9 dot underscore 
plus it needs to have at the rate. So we are writing code here to remove email IDs. Then add in the middle A to Z, capital A to capital Z, zero to nine dot underscore up to the end of word, right? And we want to substitute that by null in the doc, right? So here is the code to remove all email IDs. We can also remove all the tokens which are only consisting of numbers. So anything which starts with a number, i dot sub. If there's anything which starts with numbers, so anything between zero to nine. If there's any number out there, we want to remove it, right? So anything between zero to nine is there and we want to uh, sort of replace it, right? Up to, uh, you know, the word end. We want to replace it by null and in the dog and uh, removing tokens having numbers. We can also write code to remove special characters and symbols as well. At the end, we'll say x of i as doc. Let's do this and see that are we able to reduce the number of features? Yeah, Sirisha Escalon does carry some of the data sets and for some of the data sets, it simply uh, loads it from some repositories, right? So in data sets, you might find two options, load and fetch. Wherever there's a load, those data sets are pre-stored on your machine. It will not download those data sets. Whereas fetch, it will download it from certain repository, right? So in the data set option, you'll find both the options. So yes, it has some data sets and in some of the data sets, this data set, it was not having stored with it. It downloaded from a repository like Caddy. So let's do that here. And here we go and check it out the number of features after doing this cleaning. So after doing this cleaning, our features got reduced from 129,000 to 90,000. So we have now got reduction in feature. Right, and these are our features. Uh, I went mean, the spam classification would have same approach as any other text classification problem, which is the current problem as well. It just in current problem, we are classifying into two class, uh, sorry, 20 class, in spam, you have only two class. Yes, spam or not spam, zero or one. Like that. That's the only difference. Right. Okay, so here we can see that our features have got reduced. Now, we still have features which are like, you can see uh, spatial characters like underscore is, is, in, is a challenge, right? We can drop that as well. Doc equals re dot sub and remove all occurrence of underscore, maybe at or maybe uh, any other, you know, uh, symbols, I can pass all the symbols here and null in the doc. Yeah, we are removing, uh, you know, those words which are ending with zero to nine. So it may happen that yes, uh, you know, Shweta, it may happen that there might be some tokens which might be only numbers and may be important for recognizing a uh, specific one. So we need to actually uh, do a bit more study of the data set and recognize such things and based on that write better regular expressions. So technically I agree that yes, it may happen that we may have some tokens which may be consisting of numbers and may be important, uh, you know, uh, to be able to do text classification, to be able to recognize a few of the classes, right? So yeah, that's the, that could be the case. Now you can see that here, now we have uh, letters like A, 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 like this. Now you see, uh, again, we can do filtering is, is that if there's any token which is having size less than 20, I don't want to consider that as a feature, right? So now we seem to have a little clean data, you can see, but still we need, we have opportunity to apply limitization morphological analysis. Right, so I hope somebody was having question about why do I need morphological analysis? So you can look at here. Now we have a lot of features which are having similar meaning. For example, if you look at abide, abides. Now these two features generate the same meaning, right? And just they are present in different forms. If I would have done limitization, the number of features like this would have got reduced to a lot extent. For example, uh, you can see abridge, abridged, abridgement, abridgements, abridging, abridgement, and uh, uh, like that. Right? So these are different features which have, uh, you know, different form, same feature which has different form, right? For example, you can look at here, acceleration, accelerator, accelerators, accelerator, acceleration, like that, right? So this is what happens. You, if you do proper cleaning, you will have a good feature set, which would result and help you out to get a good text classification model. 
right so yeah that's the idea at this point we have 88000 features which is again heavy and uh, we need to do proper cleaning using regular expressions using uh, lemmatization using stemming or lemmatization or stemming any of these two and uh, uh, you can prefer using lemmatization. We can also do other clean techniques like filtering the nouns. Let's say nouns in a lot of cases may not be helpful. Uh, so you may want to filter them out. In some cases you may want to keep it. Let's say if you're not doing Windows or IBM PC, then nouns are important, but you may want to filter verbs. Verbs may not be important, right? You may want to filter out some adjectives that may not be important. At least for this case, if it is sentiment analysis, adjectives may be important, right? So that could be part of speech-based filtering you can do. You can do filtering based on uh, size of the word. You can remove limitization based uh, cleaning you can do, right? So these are a lot of opportunities that we have to be able to clean this. And that we can also put doc, uh, uh, document frequency based filtering. For example, I can put a limitation here, min df equals, let's say 10. That means we have 20 class classification. We have 11,000 documents. Instead of 11,000, let's think of it as a 10,000. Even if you think of it as a 10,000, for 20 documents, that means for every class, we'll have around 500. We'll have around 500 documents, right? So if I try to plot that here, And uh, so you can see that these are 20 classes, zero to uh, 20, right? I can also import actually, we'll import matplotlib. PLD dot, I would say set uh, or white ticks. Sorry, X ticks. So these are the 20 classes we have. If you look at the number of uh, on X text, I tend to convert value to axis units okay the x x is not working so that's fine uh, let me comment this i need to pass actually a, a dictionary there right okay so you can see that now for every class whether it is uh, you know for every class here zero class second class first class third class we have almost same number of documents right so almost 500 documents for every class so if there is any word which is occurring in only five or six document so I hope all of you agree that if there's any word which is occurring in only just five or six document, that word may not be important for identifying a specific class. So here I can, as we can see that every, every uh, particular doc category has at least 500 documents around, right? So if there's any word which is occurring in less than 10 documents, maybe five documents or six documents or eight documents may not be important word for identifying the specific class. Similarly, if there's any word which is occurring in more than 95% of documents, right? So I can put 9.95 as a threshold. If there's any word which is occurring in less than more than 10,000 documents, that means it's almost occurring in every category. That also may not be important for recognizing uh, the class associated, right? So I can put a filter like min df and max df. You can put in the, in terms of integer, you can also put in terms of percentage as well. So now you can see that our features are reduced to only 13,137, right? So putting this filter actually helped a lot, right? I can also increase this filter to let's say 15. So we got our features reduced to only uh, 9,799 features. So from 129,000, we now have only 9,799 features, right? And uh, that means now it's a little affordable size, which we can go ahead and create a vector and feed it to a machine learning algorithm. There's a question, how can I differentiate a normal number and a date time? Every number is tagged as a uh, cardinal, right? So yeah, that's uh, that's correct, right? In that case, uh, Vanita, you can use named entity recognition, right? So which is like uh, this technique you see. Uh, uh, 
this technique. NER helps you out to recognize which number is representing a date and which number is not representing a date, right? So NER based filtering can help you out to identify specific, uh, specific entities and tags. And then you can filter out those numbers which are not dates and keep those numbers or those entities which are actually dates. I hope this helps you out with that. This answers your question. Right. So yeah, this is one of the approach uh, which you can uh, you know deal with that, this scenario. So yeah, that's the idea here. So we have filled, put some filters. Still, as I said, that there's a lot of opportunity to improve this result by uh, you know uh, doing better regular expression based cleaning, limitization, and part of speech based filtering as well. But we'll go ahead and create a vector now. So it's time to create a vector now. So we'll say that x2, which is uh, tfidf dot transform x and we're going to say it to array it's going to be converting that to into array format if you look at print x2 dot shape this is the shape of our transformed array which is like you can see 11,314 documents comma 9,799 columns right so that's the shape of our array output so now our data is converted from text to numbers and we are good to go ahead and feed this out to a machine learning algorithm. If you look at any of the numbers here, right? For example, if I will show a zeroth document. So zeroth document looks like this. Maybe I can uh, print out a few of the values out of it. As in 9,000 words, you know, it's not printing out 9,000 numbers. It's not printing out them here. But yeah, uh, it can print out those values here. So these are x2. Now we have x2 and we have y. We're going to go ahead and use a, a machine learning algorithm, which can learn from this and should be able to do classification effectively. In NLP, like the way we have 9,000 features, it is still very high volume of features. If you want to identify the ideal number of features, you can think of uh, the number of category and the complexity of more data. Based on the complexity of data here, we can assume that in every class, in every category, we may have around 20 to 50 words, which may be important to recognize that category, at least 20 and at most 50. If I give it an average of 30, that means I should have 30 multiplied by 20, around 600 features. So around 600 features would be quite good volume of features. And uh, you can keep up a limit that you should not have more than 1000 features in that case, right? A very high volume of features makes it very difficult to feed this data to a complex or powerful algorithm like neural network or LSTM. So for that reason, in NLP, we don't consider using algorithms like decision tree as algorithms like decision tree cannot handle a huge number of features. That's the reason they are mainly preferred in data science, but not that way preferred in NLP. But yes, there are few algorithms like Naivebase, which is based on Bayes theorem of probability, multinomial Naivebase is one of the very popular algorithm as it is one of the very one of the fastest algorithm in whole machine learning. And it is only used for classification mainly. Right. So new base is, is a very powerful algorithm can be used for classification task, and we can do, uh, uh, you know, we can make use of it in text classification. Good part of new base is it can handle good part of new base is it can handle a huge number of features, right? And does the job effectively on large volume of data. So let's go ahead and see the example of implementation of new base here, right? Here we go. Uh, so uh, building a classifier using new base, right? So we can say from a skill learn dot, uh, oh, we already imported it, I'm sorry. So we can create a model object directly using multinomial new base here. There are a few parameters that you want to pass here. Alpha, alpha is used as a, by default, we use the value of alpha as one, because if there's no word present, we don't want, we don't want the probability to go, the whole probability to go zero. Right. So for that, we use alpha as a, a default value. If there's a word not present, the multiplication of that word is going to be one uh, reason. The value of alpha is one because multiplication of one by default makes uh, no change in the value of uh, the probability. Right. If I multiply a probability value by one, it makes no change. So that's where alpha. But yeah, in a lot of cases, people want to, uh, you know, uh, minimize the value, make it a smaller value. You can also give cross probability. In case, let's say that you want to focus more on a specific class or you want to do the cost reduction of a specific class higher compared to another class, you can do that as well. And that multinomial name base doesn't uh, need to have or uh, doesn't need a lot tuning of different hyperparameters. 
which is needed if you, in case you're using neural networks, you need to tune a lot of hyperparameters, which is not uh, needed with NeoBase. So I can directly go ahead and train the model, right? We can, we could have actually split our data into train and test set, and we should have trained the model with the train set and uh, check the performance of the model with the test set. Let's do that as well quickly here, right? So I can uh, split data into train, train and validation set, right? Test set is already separately available with this data set. So you can see that uh, I'll also show you an example of how we load test set. Okay, so I can say XTR comma XVD comma YTR comma YVD equals train test split X comma Y comma test size as let's say 0.2 random state as uh, five and uh, stratify as y. So this is gonna split the data into train set and test set. Oh, I haven't imported it from sklearn. Dot model selection. Train test split. Yeah, then with that, now we can go ahead and train the model with the train data. So we can say model dot fit XTR comma YTR, the model is trained. There's a question, uh, is multi-support vector machine classifier used efficiently? It, it works, you know, SVM or different implementation of SVM actually works in terms of feature extraction and, you know, uh, on the top of extracted features works very well. Uh, when you deal with images, but when you deal with uh, text data, the number of features could very high and they don't have spatial relationship with each other. In such scenario, it doesn't work that well. I should have actually used here X2. That was my bad. Right, so I was using uh, text data actually. Right, so SVM and even uh, multi support machine uh, does quite effective job in case you're dealing with image related problem. This, this is based on my experience. Uh, I haven't come across any paper or maybe any theory which in which I have seen people preferring SVM or variations of SVM for this uh, uh, text related applications. I have seen one of the implementation of SVM, let's say one class SVM for anomaly detection related to documents in, in NLP. So one class SVM has been used uh, quite a, a bit in anomaly detection or suspicious observation detection in NLP and also without NLP in data science as well. So that is one implementation I have come across, but yeah, mostly it is used in uh, uh, image classification scenarios. Uh, there's a question, which machine learning algorithm is best for aspect-based sentiment analysis, right? I mean, a lot depends on uh, aspect-based, if you want to do it, a lot depends on uh, the data, but yeah, one of the most effective one, I would say, uh, one of the implementation of neural network, which is LSTM, RNN modification to RNN, that is LSTM. That has been so far one of the most effective approach for developing uh, any text classification application. SVM is not necessarily a binary classifier. It can also do multi-class classification as well. Okay, so, Okay, here we go. So here we have trained the model. Now it's time to check the performance of model and also test it for a separate data. Uh, as it is multi-class classification, your uh, uh, performance metric could be accuracy, right? So that's where we can use check accuracy, right? You may not want to go for recall and other stuff, but yeah, you may want to definitely look at confusion matrix and you may want to definitely look at uh, class-wise performance as well. Right, which is classification report. So I can directly check out, go ahead and check out from sklearn dot metrics, import accuracy score, import confusion matrix. I can do, let's say ypred as model dot predict, xvd and accuracy score on test data on y bread and y v d is this and confusion matrix 
between I'm a little doubtful that it expects a multi-dimensional one or single dimensional one. So you might need to feed one hot encoded format here. But let's see that yped comma yvd. Okay. So this is actually for 20 class, which is a little challenging. So in order to in order to be able to see this out, I can actually do here import pandas as pd and uh, pd dot uh, data frame. Right, so this shows uh, the uh, confuser matrix for 20 class classification problem, right? So the accuracy here is 86%, which is accuracy on test data. We can also check out for training data, it might be a little higher. So this model should definitely overfit, right? And this is the uh, confuser matrix for 20 class classification problem. And we can see that there are few class uh, parallelization, for example, fourth class and 12th class are quite similar to each other. And fifth class and first class is quite similar to each other. And you can see there's a huge uh, confusion between 15th class and 19th class as well. Y prediction and YVD stands for Y validation. Okay. I mean, this is just a symbol. You can use anything else here. I'm considering that. Okay. So you can check out confusion matrix and check out that which documents have quite similar. So 15th document is matching a lot with zeroth uh, class and 19th class as well. Right. So that's one of the observation we can make. Now, if I have any new document, let's say that if I have any new email, which is like this. So let's say if I have any new email, which is like uh, this, let's say, hi. I purchased uh, a laptop and it is having NVIDIA GTX GeForce 658 graphics card, but uh, the graphics is not helping in recognizing the uh, or recognizing, I would say, or processing high definition videos and playing games. Do I need to have game cards or this graphics card can resolve pixel issues? Right, so this is uh, the email essay we have regards unsure, right? And we want to do the classification for this email. So what we can do is we can simply do here model dot predict uh, TF idea. So we can't feed the email directly. So we have to do TF idea of dot transform of new email dot to array. So it's going to predict the category associated with that. It says one. I can simply check out class underscore names of one. That means one means it is computer graphics, which is correct. Yeah, you don't need to clean a uh, Fabian new email because now you're, uh, you know, it's going to simply pick out the feature set. But yes, you may have to uh, remove few tokens. I mean, if you have removed a specific set of tokens, you may want to do that. I mean, if you have removed some symbols or you may have removed some underscore, you may want to do that here as well. Right. Otherwise, some important words may not be considered. But yeah, you don't need to do uh, that set of stop word removal. So stop word removal or min df, max df, that sort of processing not to be done. But if you have done regular expression based cleaning on your training data, similar regular expression based cleaning would be needed for the new data as well. Okay, so I hope you're good with this part. So this was an example of text classification problem even right at this part we are done with this. I mean, uh, there's a lot of scope to spend more time on this. Uh, we could spend a few more hours on the same problem and discussing and experimenting a lot with this, but uh, with a limitation in time, we'll have to close this example here. So at this part, we are done with the third section, which is uh, text classification. We'll be sharing all the notebooks with you and uh, this PPD as well for sure. Right. So we're done with the third segment and uh, yeah, so now we are open for questions, right? So please feel free to share your questions and your queries here. And you can ask anything related to NLP as well.
can we classify spam, spam email and delete we cannot delete automatically but yes we can do classification for deletion we have to write a software code so once we have uh, you know uh, we are able to identify that we can do the deletion manually by writing a specific code okay so that's one thing so there's a question about uh, spacey matching uh, spell mistake if we have any idea on the search paper so yeah uh, so there's a question about spelling mistake or spelling errors so i want to show an example on that Right. So you see, there are a lot of uh, methods in mathematics which can be kind of used out for uh, spelling correction, right? For example, let's say uh, there's a very popular technique called you can use check our distance, right? So check our distance can be used to check out distance between the words. So you can have a spell, uh, dictionary of all correct words and I can match any incorrect word with that. So check our distance can help you out to calculate distance. Higher the distance, lower the similarity, lower the distance, higher the similarity. You can recommend more similar words as in, as in uh, you know, important words. For example, if I look at NLTK dot jacquard distance between two words, which could be a set of, uh, now here you can do an n-gram modeling as well, right? Which would also improve your result. Let's see if I look at orange and if I look at uh, orange. So it's gonna say that distance is very less, but if the same case, if I look at orange and let's say uh, my name Anshu, so it's gonna say distance is higher. Lower the distance, higher the similarity, higher the distance, lower the similarity. Right, so uh, this is where it, you can, I'm gonna take a few questions, right? I'm just answering one of the question here, everyone, but we'll sure take all the questions. If I'm missing out, I'll definitely take it. Don't worry, just uh, please have some, uh, you know, just need to wait for that. Okay, and yes, we are done with the session. So if you are, uh, you know, you wanna leave out, you can drop out the session and uh, yeah, if you have any question, please uh, get in touch with us as well. So yeah, this Jakarta distance can help you out to, you know, look into a dictionary and check out if that word is matching with any other word. For example, I can have my dictionary as, let's say, DD equals our dictionary of uh, orange, maybe mango, maybe apple, and maybe let's say banana. So I can create a function which could be, let's say, correct. Right? So it's, this function is gonna recommend uh, spellings related to any particular wrong word, right? So I can say that default score is one, default answer is null. I can say that for W in DD, that is my dictionary, distance equals NLTK dot jacquard distance between the set of W and set of word, right? And I can check if distance is lower than score answer equals word and distance equals score, right? And finally I can return, uh, return the answer. So this could be used out. So if I have any wrong spelling, this can recommend one more similar word. For example, I say orange, it's can recommend orange. Oh, it says set, I have to say set. Uh, score, my bad. Like this oh it says banana which is incorrect actually right so um let me check if distance is lower than score score is one i always look at jacquard distance between the w and the uh, word and uh, if the distance is lower than score i say answer is w and uh, distance is equals to uh, score right which is correct sorry i should say score is equal to distance so when orange, it's gonna say orange. If I say mango, it's gonna say mango, right? If if I say that apple, it's gonna say apple, right? So this is how you can create a dictionary for this and you can, uh, you know, it can simply uh, give you recommendation about, uh, give recommendation about most correct word, right? So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so let me know any other question, everyone. If I missed your question, please put that again, right? So there is a lot of questions here. I can't uh, read all of them, but yeah, please put that again if I missed your question. This is a question, currently I'm using Python, but in future, if I want to change the language, which other language to be used for NLP? Mostly Python is very widely used. Other than that, Node.js is also widely used language. Go is a bit populating up, but at this point, I would say near future till next five to 10 years, Python is going to be staying in the market. Do you have any other session? Please let us know. Yeah, we're going to plan, everyone, we are planning for another session on deep learning, which is on image, related classification problem and transfer learning as well, right? So we would inform you and update you about those sessions as well in, in short, right? So we're gonna be planning, we're planning for similar session in upcoming week. 
on the similar topic. Uh, this question is deep learning better for text classification. Yes, it is better Sanjeev. It is better than standard application. Uh, Malik, yeah, Malika, we are uh, for this. We need to connect your, you know, our support team, and they can help you out with this. Is it compulsory to use? Uh, there's a question. Is it compulsory to use new base classification? No, it is not compulsory. You can use any other algorithm. It just this algorithm works better for large volume of data. Do you, we have another session coming up. Thank you, uh, Sojani, and we will definitely inform you. Please stay in touch with us. You can uh, follow us on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube as well for any more such detail. We keep on uh, updating ourselves on Facebook on the Facebook page of Tech Trunk, where you can get details about uh, uh, any such sessions happening up. So definitely, yes, you can get in touch with on, on social media. We keep on uh, putting such details. Right. So next session is going to be mostly next or next or next week. It is going to be uh, yeah. It's going to be mostly on image classification or computer vision related application. Like this was an NLP. Any website or textbook for further reading? Uh, Ram, I can recommend a uh, few websites. I would recommend MIT Open Courseware, which could be if you like uh, reading that. It's a little complex, but yeah, that's a good thing. A uh, book I don't have immediately in mind, but I can recommend if you can drop us an email. So is deep learning classification better for classification? Yes, it is better. Uh, do we get participation e-certificate? Uh, well, for that, I can't answer that question. I'm not the right person to answer about certificate, but maybe uh, our team in sales and marketing or maybe in, in uh, admin and support can help you out with that for sure. So I would recommend you to get in touch with the team. This is a question. Can you show your uh, mail ID? Ask for the queries. Yes, you can always reach out to us on contact at techtrunk.in. Right, so our email ID is contact at techtrunk.in. I would write that over here. You can also follow us on Facebook. So follow us on Facebook for more webinars, right? And write us email on contact at tech trunk darin. So yeah, that's the idea. Uh, Devish, I have answered your question. There's no, it's not compulsory to use new base classifier. You can use any of them. Thank you, Sojanya. Thank you, Anil. And uh, Mohammed has a question. Does text summarization also involves similar approach of text classification? No, it, uh, it is different approach. In text summarization, we use encoder decoder approach and uh, it's, uh, we use uh, LSTM or RNN as an encoder decoder algorithm to do the job. So, uh, in deep learning, it has similar approach, but it, it, it's a wide different stuff. You have encoder decoder approach, I would say. Thank you, uh, Yashodhan, for the uh, feedback. Thank you, Vinayak. Uh, Vinayak, you can connect for e-certificate to our support team. They can help you out with it, right, in case you need that. Are you sharing recorded session and material of Collab? Yes, Raj Gopal. Uh, this is going to be shared out to you or email. Any algorithm for developing NER? So NER is standard. Uh, WordNet-based model can be used out for that, Nirmala. And you can check out Spacey has many applications or methods for doing that. Uh, thank you, uh, Sirapu and Devesh. Uh, yeah, you can use neural networks. That's always better than any algorithm, I would say. Uh, how to make a user interface for inputs and use my Python-based NLP solution? Siddhartha, you can do that using Flask. You can create a web application. You can use Django and Flask. Both are very powerful frameworks in Python to do such kind of jobs. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sabita. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, would the material will be mailed to you? Yes, Fabian, the material will be mailed to you. Right, and uh, uh, regarding certificate, you can check out with uh, the point of contact of yours or maybe any other support team at our office. Uh, image classification, I'm not sure exactly the date, but yeah, the wish you can check out on Facebook and we'll definitely drop an email to you for any such uh, webinar in future. Uh, so I have answered your question, Mohammed. I hope, right, and uh, thank you very much, everyone. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, best approach to machine learning sentiment analysis, Spacey, NLT, or Stanford. Uh, machine learning, if you want to do sentiment analysis, if you want to get a good model, upon, I would say uh, develop a model from scratch using LSTM TensorFlow. Uh, I didn't get a question, Malini, with Braille conversion. I actually didn't get the meaning of Braille. Okay. So yes, you're gonna get recorded sessions over uh, YouTube. Kindly provide us participation. I'm not sure with the certificate part. I'm not the right person to answer that. Yes, and uh, yes, I can like commit you about coming webinars, which is gonna be there, but uh, not with the date right now. Thank you, everyone, and 
okay so surely you'll be receiving the link for the recorded session so thank you all for joining the session and uh, text to speech uh, you can do Malini make use of speech recognition package so speech recognition is a very popular package in Python which can help you out with this it has a free recognition option using Google you can also look at documentation of speech recognition package it is like import speech recognition as SR you can do and it's a built-in package in Python for you pop one you can use that out Uh, Sanjeev, for list of projects, uh, I can't give you at this point. I mean, I don't have a list in mind, but yes, uh, I can give you examples which could be uh, develop a chatbot or develop a uh, topic modeling application. You can actually work on COVID-19 data, which is available on Kaggle. A lot, huge amount of NLP data on that. You can identify the hidden topics and uh, uh, the concepts which are being discussed out. I mean, you know, the context which are being discussed out on in those corpus. The problem statement uh, could be, yeah, you can look at on COVID-19 data. That's one of the very uh, uh, popular data sets in recent time, I would say. And on that topic modeling, like identifying hidden topics, building a custom NER, developing a chatbot for support and sales are a few problem statements you may want to work out on. Identifying sensitive information, tagging them up, encoding that, identifying content moderation, identifying suspicious text or hate speech identification from a huge amount of text data are a few of the topics you may want to work out on. So recorded session, yes, you're going to be accessing that over email. We'll share you the link, but mainly we'll upload it on YouTube and we'll share the link over email. Uh, for text summarization, we mainly make use of LSTM in encoder decoder format, and that helps in summarization. Okay. So yes, that's the idea so far, everyone. I hope we're good with this. So with this part, we'll be ending up here. Thank you for joining this session. And uh, uh, we'll end up here. Uh, the open source tool coin then, as I said, like NLTK, Spacey, and Gensim could be open source tools which can help you out with this. And up here, thank you for joining. We are ending up the session here.